Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring Mongolian shamanic initiation. My guest is Gail Heisen, who is the podcaster of the Small, Medium, at Large podcast. Gail has received an honorary doctoral degree from the Mongolian Academy of Sciences for her work with shamans in Mongolia. I think you'll get the most out of this particular video if you've watched the previous videos with Gail on Mongolian shamanism. In fact, other previous interviews with her as well. This is sort of the culmination of a long story that we've been telling through several interviews up until now. Gail lives in Sebastopol, California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. By the way, this was given to me. This was Ruth Inga Hines' drum that she used for all her ceremonies. Okay. Welcome, Gail. What a pleasure to be with you once again. 
It's a pleasure to be here, Jeffrey. And of course, our viewers are probably very curious about what they've just witnessed and heard. You've got so much to talk about today, and I think before we get into the specifics of the initiation ritual, which uh, will be the main focus of our conversation, it might be useful to talk a little bit about the objects that you have with you, what you're wearing, and the various sounds that people have heard? Yes. In uh, 2011, September 22nd, 2011, I was initiated as a Buryat Mongolian shaman by Zagda, who had come to the United States from Mongolia. And even though I did not ask to be initiated, she told me that that's what we needed to do because I had a lot of spirits around me. It's almost just like all these things where we're seeing, we, we look back and we see that all these things were laid before me to really be, prepare for this actual initiation. So first off, the Dell or Deal, it's spelled D-E-E-L, that I'm wearing. This was all made for me on my first trip to Mongolia. I think it's like a silk brocade piece. It's a very beautiful thing. It's all lined on the inside, and it was presented to me by um, a very lovely woman who's one of the most well-known artists in Mongolia. And I came to find out sometime later that this was actually the last sewing and work that her and her mother had done together because her mother passed away shortly after this was made. So I feel extra special about this particular garment that I didn't know was going to become my shaman clothing back then. And this hat was presented to me at the end of the conference by the woman who was doing all the translating. So this also came from Mongolia. And then these are the mirrors that we spoke about which were made in Mongolia, and they're all out of brass. And I've learned more about these since our talks, which is that they are used for the Mongolian shamans for protection when they're doing work with negative or dark energies. It's used to protect them. The Are these, can you see these clearly, these snakes? These snakes are considered alive. And what you do is you touch your hand with a little milk and you put a little milk here. This is how I was taught by Zagda. Because they are alive, you want to feed them. And milk is what's used for purification and it's white and it's used in all ceremonies that I've seen in Mongolia. This is a 100 year old otter skin. I don't know if you can see that was given to me by Jean Malay, which was caught by her partner, Daryl's father. That's how come we know it's over 100 years old. On the back, which I find you see a lot in shamanism, you'll see the fox. Can you see that? Yes, of course. So that fox hung in a very well-known uh, scientist in Mongolia's home, Dr. Lagva, and it was sent to me the night before I was leaving. These gifts always come right when you're leaving. And it was sent to me and he said he hoped I'd be able to get it through customs, that he wanted me to have his fox. All these items came before the actual initiation. So I had them here ready to go when we ended up doing this initiation. Uh, some of the other things here, I think there's a belt. I'm not sure if you can see, but there's a belt with brass mirrors all around the belt. And I think you can see maybe if I step back a little. And earlier I had on, could you grab that for me? Earlier I had on a shaman hat that was made for me. I was initiated in this particular hat. But another shaman, we call her Honey because it's too hard to say her name, and she was the most beautiful shaman that I'd ever seen. She was 28 years old when she came here. And she took these things that I had, these particular feathers, and she made me the shaman hat headdress. It's very important. This has uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven feathers on the front. And what I did is you have to make a face on this because this becomes your new way of viewing when you become a shaman you're putting this on and you're using your third eye and connecting to spirits and things 
where you're not using your regular eyesight. So you create a whole face there with eyes and nose, and it's always it's often done in seashells. You'll see in different shamanic headdresses. And uh, so I was very fortunate that she made this for me when she happened to come through. And she also gifted me those bells that I was uh, ringing. This is called the curtain. And the thickness of, of the curtain has to do with the level of the shaman. I'm just a beginner shaman. So my curtain has a, a, the ability for me to be able to sort of see a little bit through it. But it still blocks my vision some. When you are a, 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 a shaman of many, many years, you'll see the curtain Often it's dark black and it's twirled, you know, it's yarn things that are twirled, but it's so thick. There's no way that that shaman can see anything out of that when he's wearing that or she and doing shamanic uh, ceremony. On the sides, I have ears that were given to me by a very dear friend, Shaibu, whose family are from um, Ghana. And he, his family had... Um, been known for generations for making the talismans for the shamans there. So when he was visiting his family, he asked for the talismans man to make me a pair of these. So this is what my ears are made out of. So these are the items on the shaman headdress. And the things that I was playing, when this was gifted to me by our shaman honey, she said to me, this is what you use to call the spirit. This is for calling the spirit when you start your ceremony. So this is a sound for calling spirit. The most important tool in the shaman's work, which I've just come to know, is actually called the blue horse. And that's the jaw harp. The jaw harp is the most important thing like when shamans come to visit, sometimes they don't have any of their regalia and all their things on, but they always have their jaw harp wrapped in cloth and that's always with them. And they could just do a ceremony, perform anything right then and there with their jaw harp. For some reason, when I first played the jaw harp, I have some sort of affinity with this and I'm not a musical person. It's not really considered a musical instrument. It's an instrument to, to, to bring the spirits in and the spirits of would be like my ancestors that I would be calling to to do a ceremony. When I do a ceremony, when someone comes to my home, I don't do much talking. It's all just about sound. And I play a conch shell and I play some of the instruments that you heard me do just when we started. And uh, when I do these, different visions come while I'm doing them. And then at the end of the experience with whoever's here with me, I then tell them what were the things that I saw during the time that we were making all these sounds. Um, I've, I have incorrectly called myself a white shaman because that's what I thought I was initiated at, but when I spoke with all my uh, people in Mongolia to clarify this for this show, I found out that there are indeed three shaman levels of, or not levels, but three different shamans in Mongolia, there is the white shaman, the, 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 the black shaman, and the yellow shaman. The yellow shaman is the one that actually I was initiated at, which has a combination of Buddhism mixed in with the uh, shamanic rituals and things. And that's why there are often these different, um, uh, different articles. And uh, I just discovered that this one item I was given called the the Kaling, is that how you say it? It's a Tibetan Buddhist device. I found out more information about it. It was given to me by a shaman many, many years ago before I was initiated. And I did not know that it was actually a very important tool for Tibetans and Buddhism. And so since Boryat is a combination of Buddhism with the shamanism, that that's who I was initiated by Zagda, that makes me then initiated as a yellow shaman. The um, white shaman is the shaman of healing and uh, prayer. And then the dark shaman is the one who fights negative energy, goes to the underworld, tries to help in the cases of, you know, different issues. So 
let's see. I was sharing the things I was showing you. I, I know we have pictures, but I do want to just hold these up anyway because it's easier to talk about them. These were given to me by Bat Bayar, and most many of the things I have have been given to me by Bat Bayar. So without him, I would not be so accessorized in this world. But you can see these are all different little tools, and they're actually miniature little tools. Like this is a little a little hammer, and this is a a scissor, and this is a a, a knife or a you know a sharp long knife. And these are all handmade and they are to be sewn. I have not done that yet, but they they are sewn into your clothing and the shaman uses these tools when going to the underworld or wherever world they're going to to do their work. These are the tools they use dur during that time. Can I ask you a few questions? Yes, because I think I got everything on the... Oh, wait, there was one more item on the clothing I want to show you. There's these Tibetan bells. Oh, yes. Which I don't know what the... There has to be bells all over. Yes. Thank you. And over here, it's very hard for me to show you, but I think... Can you see that there? It's like three long... I can, I can see them. So those are also some sort of a special... It has to be in three. It's considered like a bell but it's a bell that has no thing inside to make sound. And that's also put, when I was initiated as a shaman and Bat Bayar came to visit, he, he brought those to me and said, you must put these on your shaman clothing, it's very important. So that would then finish me on my shaman clothing. <laughs> Let's go back to the veil for a moment that covered your face when you began initially. What is the purpose of the veil? The purpose of the veil is to take away your eyesight from your human, your bodily eyes and to then go up here to your third eye and to be seeing from up here so that down here you're not using that face anymore. You're using the new face like we saw here in this headdress. There's the eyes, there's my nose, those are the ears that becomes your face. That becomes how you're seeing and dealing in the spirit world. When Zagda initially said, "You, it's time for your initiation, I can see you are surrounded by spirits. What did that mean to you, or what does it mean now? How do you, do you feel yourself surrounded by spirits? I always have. And I've always been told that whenever I've had like a psychic reading or a psychic healing or I just meet some Native American person or something, they all say to me, do you know about the spirits? Or do you know about the ones that are, that sometimes people would say, you have a room full of spirits around you. Do you, want, do, do you realize this? So I've been told that for many, many years, but, and I had d definitely been doing things that I consider of a shamanic nature but I never thought about being initiated as a shaman or that that was going to be my future. I had no idea that that was going to happen to me. But when I look back now, I see that all these different shamans uh, gave me gifts. Like this was a gift of a pendulum from an Ecuadorian shaman. And this will tell me yes or no very, very accurately. And I have used it with many people when they've come to my house trying to solve a problem. And I always say, don't even tell me the question because it doesn't matter to me. Just, just tell the tell tell the tell tell the tell it tell it out here in your just from your heart in your mind, and the ball will give us the answer. And um, often these gifts have been given to me with no information, and I don't have a translator at the time to let me know. So this particular gift I just learned more about today, and I know you have photos that we can post up, but I just thought it would be good to show it anyways, because I'd like to blow on it once. This was part of Tibetan, This the reason I, I was given this before I was initiated as a Buryat shaman, years before. And I find this a very interesting thing because it's part of the, the only people that use this are the Tibetans and the Buryat shamans. It's not part of the article of clothing 
or regalia or part of your tools that's given in the other uh, it's part of uh, the Buddhist so I'm gonna open it up for you and tell you what the history is I know I don't know about this particular one though I have asked my Mongolians they did tell me it's called the Kaling I think it's K A L I N G something like that Kaling and it's used um, it's used uh, uh, as a sound as an instrument and it would be used to um, I, I had originally been told by the Zord Spatar who had given this to me that it was used to um, rid negative energy but what I've read recently and have been told um, it actually has something to do with um, music and making sound and that the Buddhist combination shaman thing has to do with making a lot of sounds I did not know that but that was what I was drawn to do after I was initiated so I feel like I haven't gotten all the information but I'm following what I should be doing without knowing so this is I don't know how old this is but if this is antique original but in the very very old days it was taken as a femur bone from a um, you had to be a virgin a female virgin and you had to be of a very spiritually high evolved person it wasn't they, they you know they weren't picking out a prostitute to take this bone from and then the bone was used it's wrapped on each end and when I was in Mongolia I saw them in museums in glass cases and they would be wrapped on each end in silver uh, there's a little bit of bone left in the middle and it's blown like this and it's kind of an odd sound so I'm going to just blow that for you for a second if that's okay <laughs> What I read recently is that what it was used for was the inevitability that we're all going to die. And there was something about this that's supposed to be keeping aware of that fact. The thing I was told when I got it was that I was supposed to tie my own hatag onto it. And I don't know how old this is, but here's the hatag that was on it the first time. And you can see it's, it's very old and worn looking. So that one's been here for some time. Then the next person who had this put another cloth on, and then I think I put two on here. So I just wanted to show this as part of that. And also, when I've seen the photos of the shaman people wearing this, it would be worn on the side like this, just sort of hanging down in your, in your clothing. Tibetan monks, apparently this was very big for the monks. Now it's also part of, I guess for for some part of shamanism. So I just wanted to share that because it was a very unusual gift that was given to me by Zord's Batar, and I was never sure really that much to, kn to know about it. In fact, I hadn't even brought it out during my Zagda experience. So that's it on my tool, okay. <laughs> well, I think we have a good idea of, of uh, the items that you are wearing and the items that are surrounding you, but it's much more interesting, I think, to talk about the the inner experience and uh, what it was like for you. Uh, of course, we, I'm sure the viewers are very curious about the actual ceremony itself, but I'm particularly interested in how you felt uh, transformed by going through this initiation. Well, first, I'd like to describe a little bit of what happened because it was a whirlwind experience. And it was a, I can't remember what day it was, but Zagda had actually packed up and left my house. So we said goodbye, and she was on her way to Chicago. And two or three days later, she appeared back here at my door. And that's when I said, well, how come you came back? And that's where the story about the spirits came out. So she said to me, we had to start working now because it would take many days to prepare all of the items. So it was a very high energy, intense thing where we didn't sleep much for about five days. 
because we would be up till all hours of the night making the things that were going to be put on to this uh, Mongolian deal, uh, or Dell, and the difficult, most difficult part was making these snakes. Each one had to be a certain amount of centimeters, and when she came down and measured them in the morning, we didn't make them to the perfect centimeters. We had to redo them all. They can only be stuffed with... Um, sheep's wool that's from a live sheep it can't be from like a sheep was killed and you're getting you're you're getting the fur off the sheep it had to be live sheep wool and it's very difficult to work with and it has to be pulled through these tubes so these are all filled with you know sheep 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 fur inside of here the fact that we did not have a translator put a little bit of stress on us but we ended up finding that the best way to communicate was telepathically. And so, you know, often the process is, is that gets you to the final thing. The process is all an amazing experience because before you become the shaman. So she would yell at us and tell us about different things. And we would ask, what is it you need? What is it you need? And uh, we would come up with all the different things, make these things every night. It was, my whole world had to stop. Whatever things I had that I was going to do in those days had to all be canceled. And all we focused on was preparation for this ceremony and shamanic initiation. We had one very fabulous moment that I thought was really amazing. Zagda was looking very concerned that she needed something and that in order to perform the ceremony, she had to have certain things in order to be able to do this initiation. And she wasn't in Mongolia where she could have access to all those things. So she's thinking and she's looking at me and she's talking in Mongolian saying, I need this thing, I need this thing. And I just look at her and I go upstairs to my bag of, I have a, a shamanic area in my, in my bedroom that's like an altar and all my things shamanic. And I come back down with this bag, I'm going to show you. And this is what it looks like. Can you see this? Well, it, it looks like some sort of plant material. Some sort of dried herb from Siberia that for some reason, at some point, someone had given me once. I knew nothing about it except that I kept it up there with my things. And when she was thinking about this thing she needed so badly, I came down with this. And she was in such awe. She just said, Gail, Gail, Gail. It was exactly what she wanted to be able to need to, to burn. And what it's used for is a cleansing. And you burn it to keep away the dark energy. So that's why she needed that during the shamanic initiation, because dark energy can and did enter during our ceremony. But we can talk about that when we get toward the ceremony talk. But So we came up with all of these things. And uh, we did it all with telepathy. And I find that to be a very phenomenal thing that two people could communicate that don't speak each other's language and produce exactly the things that she wanted. And I, I anyway, so that was a, like just a thrill in itself to be able to communicate like that. She did take, you know, all these different people had to participate. You do not become initiated as a shaman. It's just you and the shaman. People, there was there was 10 people that she said, you must have 10 people to do the work to help. And so 10 friends or family showed up to do whatever work she assigned them to do. And one of the interesting ones was one of them had been my therapist at one time. And he came and she picked him of all the people that were here to be the guardian of the fire. And so he had to take nine rocks from my house and keep them in this burning fire for like six or seven hours so that these these rocks were going to be part of the initiation and they had to be as hot as she wanted and they had to be in the fire as long as she needed. My husband was assigned to go and find dried up horse manure. And we took this three mile walk for exercise and we passed, you know, we live in a rural area. There are lots of people here with horses and animals. So we knew we, we knew some neighbor with some horses and my husband went over there and 
he felt, you know, he is a black man, and he was thinking that, you know, what are they going to do if they see him outside picking, you know, horse manure up out of their yards? So he was filming himself at the same time and saying, I'm only doing this for my wife, you know, I'm not here for anything other than that. <laughs> and he comes back home, and Zagda's waiting at the door, and he presents her with these, this little kind of like this in his hands of the horse manure, and he's, he's so proud of what he did, and she looks at him, and she's so pissed. She's like, what? This is what you bring me? This is not, this isn't what we need. She says, get in the car. <laughs> so they went in the car together and uh, she took him to the spot where she saw all the thing and they filled up two white plastic garbage bags like you and your house. That's how much manure she needed. And this manure had to be dried to the level of being able to burn and they were placed in abalone shells around the base of my giant redwood tree. She picked my redwood tree because it was the tallest and oldest tree on our property. We don't know how old it is, but it's more than 100 years. Could be 300, we have no idea, but it's incredibly tall, old redwood. The work in preparing the tree itself, tables and tables were laid out with food and all of the articles that were going to become my shamanic tools had to be blessed and part of the ceremony, but not put on my body until after I was actually initiated. They had to take salt. And when I say salt, one giant box of kosher salt was not enough. We needed like five or six boxes of giant boxes of salt. And we needed, um, in fact, we ran out and had to get more before the ceremony because a salt circle is placed all around the perimeter of the tree including where we're going to sit, including all the tables, so that we now had what was considered a gear. She made an invisible doorway. She made walls and sides with the salt. That's what that was signifying, so that we were now in a sacred place in a Mongolian gear, and there would we, we would have this ceremony. I think this is one of the most fascinating aspects of the ceremony, the invisible gear, which is, I guess, another word would be a yurt. Uh, in other words, a, a structure in which, if you were in Mongolia, you would have been in a real gear, I presume. But for ritual purposes, you can make an invisible one. And it reminds me of an interview on shamanism, Egyptian style shamanism I did with Nikki Scully, where... Uh, in her property in Oregon, they created an invisible Egyptian temple to use for ritual purposes. It's a small world. She used to shop in my produce stand. She was one of my biggest customers because she was feeding all the people that were like the Grateful Dead people. And so she would come into my store and buy boxes and boxes of produce. And I heard later she went on to Egyptian. I, just, I had just heard about that. Uh, so here we have the invisible gear and we had to have a lot of food. So there were certain points where certain, there had to be chickens and chicken bones. There were certain specific foods that had to be on the table. And I, I know she would have pro probably preferred to have lamb, but we didn't have any lamb at the time. So we used the chicken and she made little nests out of that, um, special uh, uh, fresh sheep fur, and um, she uh, put little eggs in it. And she made these little nests, and then she took cups, and cups were filled with fat. And the fat that we could come up the best with was butter. So you melted the butter, put it in the cups, it solidified, and then the cups had to be hung around the tree. So there were people out there hanging these cups so that the tree would be fed with the fat. We then had to prepare something that I'm so glad wasn't my assignment because I can only draw stick figures. But my husband, who's talented musically and artistically, he sat at the table and I don't know how many nights it took him. And she said, I need 12 children and they have to be different kinds of children. So David draws 12 children. Some look Asian, some are black, whatever, different children. And then he's drawing the children and he shows it to her on the fabric and he figures she'll be happy again. But instead she says, what? They need shoes. They need hats. They need complete outfits. So it wasn't just like draw a child. It's draw a child with every accessory on them. And so her and my, my dear friend Kim and David 
finish this entire 12 children's long tapestry thing that we then had to hang in the tree. It was taken at the end of the ceremony and packed away in her suitcase. And I asked her what, why we don't get to keep it. And she said, this goes home with me for all the students that I have ever initiated. I think I was number 63, 62 or 63, uh, and only one of two that were not Mongolian. Uh, she hangs it at her home and all the different peoples are there that she has initiated. So that's where our white tapestry, my husband our husband and Kim's artwork are hanging in her home in Mongolia. I have to say, I can't draw, but she bullied me and <laughs> yelled at me until I drew all these. <laughs> she was a very tough, she's a very, she was very tough. You, this is not a, you know, this is not a butterflies and unicorn kind of experience. <laughs> Well, Zagda is a, a woman we spoke about in our previous interview. You described her as a very fierce shaman, a woman who carries a whip and whips people. She's very powerful, very, very powerful and tough. So we had to do all these different things to prepare for this ceremony. And then on the day of the ceremony, all these chairs were set up, so we had about 20 people that came, but it was very short notice, and it was during working hours, so whoever could come showed up not knowing what was going to happen. I have photos that I've I've sent you some of, but I don't have a lot because during the actual complete initiation part, we did no filming and no photos. Um, I was very fortunate to have a, a dear friend that was one of the uh, co co organizers on the Ruth Inga Hines Shamanism Conference, a very wonderful woman, and uh, she <laughs> did me the honor of going home. Her name is uh, Linda Braga, and Linda went and wrote every single thing, which is what I had forwarded to you, because I could not write what was happening to me at this ceremony. I couldn't write the things that were going on. I was immersed in this ceremony. And I was definitely in an altered state at a certain point. So the things that I have to share, I know from being being able to read what she saw going on. And since we didn't photograph or film that, it was a beautiful thing that she did that for me. So there was a there's a point when you start the the ceremony. I was dressed in an old um, African robe that my husband David had got when he was a teenager, I think, in Africa and had had all these years and it just fit me just perfect and it felt so good. So I wore that as the preparation before shaman clothing. And there were numerous things that I had to do, which had to do with um, jaw harp, chanting, dancing. And um, I... At, I'm not sure at what point, because I can't really tell you, but I became in a completely altered state where I really didn't feel my body anymore or the fact that it was 100 degrees outside and I might be overheated or any of these things, like everything of the of the regular body things went away and I became in an altered state completely, which I believe you have a photo of. Uh, and when I see it, I can see that also, but it was my children who said to me, Mom, I saw you, and when I saw what you were like in that heat, completely dancing and chanting, he said, my son, Rich, I knew that you were in an altered state because you never could have done that in your regular body. You would have been so tired and hot, you couldn't have gone on like that for hours. So there's something that goes on during this where you're tapping into an energy that's of a different nature. There was one point during the ceremony where something negative, some negative dark energy was coming in and Ayuna and Zagda did a whole like special thing yelling at the dark spirit to, to go away. You mentioned Ayuna now, I think for the first time. She's the other shaman who was there assisting Zagda. She was a shaman in training with um, Zagda and she's also the wife of my dear friend Bat Bayar and she's also like family to us. She's not just Ayuna. She's she's like our family. And she was assisting and helping with all of these things. 
And uh, so her and uh, Zagda and Ayuna, because when you do these things and you're going into altered states, people have to watch you because you can just fall over. You can you can hurt yourself. It's not like you just left there blindly to experience these experiences. They're there to make sure to take care of you while this is going on. So that was part of Ayuna's job, you know, to assist her and to assist me at the same time. And it was, it was, anyways, I'm very touched that she was the person that was there to do that. And her husband is Bat Bayar, who has brought all these people to me and has opened up this whole world of Mongolia. So I'm very grateful to those, that, that wonderful couple. And, and if I recall correctly, Bat Bayar is both a shaman and a scholar. No, he is not a shaman at all. He is a historian. He can tell you everything about shamans, everything about shamanism. He's a brilliant PhD. He teaches at the university there, and he's considered a professor of historian, information, cultural, shamanic of all of Mongolia. A scholar of shamanism. He's a scholar. And his wife, Ayuna, is a, an apprentice shaman. She was an apprentice, and I don't think know if she continued on because all of a sudden they got a whole flood of grandchildren and I think she might have become a grandma and end up doing that as her, her work right now. <laughs> as a result of this initiation, you are now considered a shaman. Even if only a beginner shaman, you are a shaman. Yes, and that's where I want to talk about the emotional part of this. That You were asking me what it feels like inside. Hmm. I did not realize how important this shaman initiation was in validating or giving me a certificate of something about honoring something about who you are. And I'd always felt that because I didn't go to high school and I didn't have a diplomas and I didn't go to colleges, you know, that I, you know, that I was just sort of floating along and I've never really had a particular title of anything. But I seem to have abilities in these areas which all fall into shamanism, which is being a medium, being a re, you know remote viewing, being somebody who can speak to the dead, or I'm just there's so many things that I've done all along that kind of fall into the shamanic thing. So it like gave me a safe way to practice the things that I've done with other people, but feel totally protected in myself now, not worrying about other things that are going to harm me or come into me. When I put this clothing on, I feel very safe and very protected to do any kind of work with dying people or people have fears of things or people who uh, want to talk to somebody who's who's gone. So now I have like a form. I didn't have that before or the shingle or I don't know what you want to call it. And... Um, I've had very interesting experiences since I've come into the shaman thing. And I, I wanted to mention a couple of them just, just quickly so people don't think that I just got these clothing, got the initiation, and nothing happened. In fact, starting with our very first interview, you talked about having these abilities going back to your uh, childhood. Exactly. So in my childhood, I would do astral travel and leap out of my body and go around the house. Now I wear my shaman clothing and I'm reaching out to spirit or I'm reaching out to, you know, connect with the person who's sitting in front of me. I had uh, three interesting ones that I had wanted to tell you about um, that were um, one was a dear friend. Another one was somebody that I didn't know at all. And someone was another dear friend. And each one was an entirely different experience. In one of them, I experienced doing virtual shaman cleansing, which I did not know was possible. But because of COVID, I could not go to my dear friend who's leaving her home after 35 years. And she had had lost her husband and her daughter to suicide in, in, in her home. And we did a shamanic cleansing that when we finished and the new people came in and she walked in the house, everything had been lifted and she felt like she was giving them a completely clean space. This is what I talk about when I talk about like a blessing. 
Then the other one was a gentleman who I did not know at all, but his father and I were very close. And his father passed away, and his family felt that I had something to do with his more spiritual awareness that he was always fighting to not have anything to do with. But in knowing me, it started opening up his spiritual thoughts and thoughts about death and all these things. Well, it turned out at his um, memorial, which was at a lake near where we live, his son was not doing well and couldn't handle the loss of his father. And this is a grown man, you know, in his 50s or whatever, maybe 60s. And uh, so I just invited him and said, you know, if you ever feel like you'd like to come over, even though this is someone who has nothing to do with shamanism or spirituality or meditations or anything like this. He said, yeah, can I can I come with my wife? I said, of course, of course you can bring your wife. And he came and when he came, he looked so sad. And we did this ceremony. And when I did the jaw harp, I kept hearing hearing his dad's name saying, I love you, son. I love you, son. And I just kept playing that through my jaw harp. I love you, son. And when we finished, tears rolled down his face and he just like everything lifted and he became this like brighter, opener person that like was able to let go and also connect in this realm with his dad. And I never know what's going to happen when these things, I don't claim to be someone that can do, you know, instantly any of these things. I just say whatever happens is what we'll see. And we had a beautifully deep connection. And when he left, his family told me it happened to be his birthday of the father, the, di the day we picked. Without me knowing that, I said, I like to do it on a Sunday. Can we do it this day? And that turned out to be his dad's birthday. So when he left, he went to his family and they let me know later that it was they saw he had lightened up, that there had really been a change. So something's happening, but it's in the invisible. And the last one I have to mention about is what it's like for me as a shaman when I'm doing this kind of medium type, you know, connecting to the dead person's thing. A very dear friend of mine, Paul, came from New York and he had lost um, his partner of, I think they were together, was close to 40 years or maybe a little more. So it's a long, a hard loss when that's been your partner for that many, many, many years. And I said, well, you know, if you'd like, I'll do a little, you know, blessing and something with you with him. And we go up there, also a person who's never had anything to do with shamanism or any of these kind of types of healing or anything. And it was the first time that I'm experiencing like I'm up against a wall. Like when I'm trying to connect to his partner, I'm hearing these things going, no, 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 I don't believe in any of that stuff. You know, I don't believe in any of that. You know, I'm dead. <laughs> And I get this intense smell of cologne where it could like knock you over. And I tell him at the end, I tell him what's happening and how. And he says to me, yep, he, he wouldn't even let me go for, for, for psychology or therapy. He said we weren't allowed to do anything like that. He said no kind of nothing. He said he said he would he would have completely objected to me doing this shamanic thing. He said. And if you he said I, you could live for a few years on the amount of money he spent on cologne. He said, and the amount that's here and the amount he would wear was unbelievable. So I knew that I'd connected because, you know, I, I had met this man once, you know, 35 years ago or something. And when we, we, we did the connection and I wanted to connect him together, we used my little pendulum at the final part of the ceremony. And I said, Ask him whatever you want to ask. And he got the answer to the question. And then when he went back to New York, he wrote to me and he said, can I tell you the question I asked? I said, well, you don't have to. He said, I have to. He said, I just asked him if I'll see him again and if he's everything's OK. And he said, yes. And he said, and that made me feel so good inside. So that's my experience of sharing what it is I've been doing since I was initiated. I was doing things like that before, but it wasn't where I was protected. And it wasn't where I knew that I had the strength to do this with these people. And I wouldn't be taking the spirits of their dead person with me afterwards. 
So this is part of the initiation process that I feel has done so much for me. I've also been taught by other Mongolian shamans as they've come through here. And one of them, Dr. La Guaja, he was, Bat Bayar considers him the most uh, brilliant and powerful shamans of the, all the ones that we've ever met. And he was the one my children loved the most. And I always trust their judgments because they're very good on these things. He woke up in the middle of the night staying here at one in the morning and transferred into me an hour's worth of the drumming teaching without any translator. He just bodily took the drum and showed me how to move with the, with, with the, with the body, with the drum. And then it, it felt like being taught the secret information on how the drumming is done. And it had something to do with the actual numbers from one to 12 that you were actually taking the drum and in the first motion you were making like a one and you're drumming at the same time but you're making sort of like a two. And when I asked for this deep explanation of what a scholar or person would want to know, he said to me, there's nothing for me to teach you. I've transferred it to you. That's how it's done by transferring, he said. There's no, there's no, no, no words for me to tell you. I had another one, um, uh, Kanda. She was the sweetest, loving, kind woman, a very different approach than, say, the tough Zagda kind of shaman. And she taught me more about the jar harp playing. And she just said, just keep playing every day because new sounds will come out of you as you grow more and more spirits and as you get stronger with the jaw harp. So she taught me that. And then sometimes we play together over um, FaceTime or whatever it is from here to Mongolia. And I play and she plays. And so I'm still getting teaching and I'm still in connection with all the teachers, including Zagda, that I've met in Mongolia. So I'm very grateful for all the things they've done for me. And by the way, not one of them ever asked me for a penny for anything that they gave me or offered me or taught me. It was all done from the heart and freely. And I, I feel that, that that's a very beautiful thing. Part of the initiation included a kind of purification. As I recall from the description, you had to strip naked and you had hot, uh, was it hot vodka or some hot uh -huh. liquids poured all over you? One of my favorite stories. <laughs> we spoke earlier about my former therapist who was now in charge of the fire and the rocks. And I had one of these special buckets that you use in your wood stove to put the hot ashes in. So I knew it was a safe bucket. You know, we're here in California. This is September. The whole place could have gone up if these kind of fires everywhere, <laughs> things we were doing. So, and you're trying to explain that, but it doesn't matter because you have to do it how she says. So I had specified, and I did get a translator because I had been whipped by her in Mongolia in a ceremony. And it was a gentle whipping. I had my clothes on. It wasn't anything, you know, terrible to speak about, but it was still being whipped. And I did see that she did a lot stronger whipping when the persons needed a lot more kind of healing or ridding of something of the body. So I had expressed through some translator, could you see if there was any other way she could initiate me other than whipping? <laughs> well, I didn't know that... Instead of whipping, I was going to go to scalding, so, <laughs> which, you know, in, if anyone studies on these different things in the different cultures, we all know that um, every culture has some form of burning out or heating out or ridding the negative energy in your aura or your energetic field, whatever you want to call it, before they're transforming you into the shaman. So I actually didn't take my clothes off because I was already in this altered state and I was brought over by Ayuna and her, I think. I'm not sure how I got to the to the barrel and the people were sitting there watching, including my mother. And all of a sudden they took all my clothes off because I just had that one, you know, African thing on. And I was I think I got to keep my underwear on. I'm not sure on that one. And I had to squat over this nine rocks in this bucket. So just imagine thinking like if you had to pee somewhere or you might be using a bucket to go in, it's sort of like that kind of idea where you're squatting over it. 
And while I squatted over it, the next thing I knew, from my top of the head down, they poured milk, vodka, and possibly water. I don't think so. I think it might have just been milk and vodka. But when it would go over my body and then hit the hot stones, it would create a steam that the scream that came out of me when it first went up my thighs and into my crotch, I screamed so loud, my niece took her kid and, you know, rushed him away, you know, because things happen so fast and you don't know what's coming next. My mother was like, what's going on, you know? <laughs> and it was the way of purifying my whole being and leaving the gale before and cleansing it to becoming the gale that will be a shaman. After she treated me this way, all the guests that were there had to go and be at the bucket. But they didn't have to take their clothes off. It was cooled down a whole lot by then. And each one had to stand over it. And she would do the same sort of thing. And when she'd sensed, like one person had written how she had sensed they had a problem in their leg or back or somewhere, she did a little extra something on them while they were over the pot to help them to heal that pain or injury that it was. So each other person got a blessing after the initial cleansing and the nakedness and that whole thing. It was very unusual. Are there any new abilities that you've found in yourself since the initiation? Oh, before that, can I just finish the end of that? I forgot. There was a very important part that my husband had to play again. And by the way, he was a very wonderful assistant being yelled at by this woman. And he did whatever, you know, he, he really stepped up to the plate here. I don't know if other husbands would have done this for their wife. <laughs> he had to take this Mongolian hat and put it on backwards. And he had to take all the nine rocks and go backwards out my driveway, which is a long driveway, by the way and go out to the road to a place that was not my property. And these were like, we didn't know when she wanted these rocks. These were like fancy landscape rocks I had. So they were all like beautiful from the river, those, you know, really round, nice ones. So my husband had to do what she said because now they were filled with all the negative energy of all these people and she didn't want any of it on the property. So, and he had to go backwards. I don't know the significance. And he placed the rocks on the road across from us, away from our property. They were gone the next morning. They didn't see them again. Somebody picked them up and took them all because they were landscaping rocks. <laughs> but hopefully, whatever, they took them, they, whoever took them, hopefully they had a blessed experience there. But that would have been the end of the stone. I had just wanted to be sure we, we finished that up correctly. So then you were asking me, what the, were there things that happened? New abilities uh, that you found within yourself. I found that my jaw harping has become stronger. And because I was, I had tried the jaw harp before just for fun. But after this, it became like connected to me. Like it's, it's, it's my tool. It became part of something that's very important to me. Um, the other thing that I felt more, is I've been doing all of these kinds of things already, but I had never used sound. And there's something about these sounds. I don't know if it has to do with frequencies or what exactly happens, but because of this, I have learned to play sounds from numerous different things that feel like they are, you know, ridding of negativity or they are creating a sacred or safe space. I've, I've become a relationship with these tools that I never knew before. They were just, you know, a bell, but now they have a, a whole different significance to me. Also, as I recall in the report that your friend wrote, Linda Braga, uh, there was a moment when one of the shamans, I don't remember if it was Zagda or Ayuna, became possessed herself by some ah. sort of dark energy. It wasn't a dark energy. They, there was the incident of the dark energy. But what this was, was the shamans that have come here have all certain, like they have two or three spirits that they work with. I haven't come to that point where I just identify 
the spirit and know that that's who it is. I just, I can feel and know that the energy's there, but I don't have like a face to it or a personality. But these shamans become the personality. All of a sudden, the spirit will jump in of one of their people. So she had, um, like the the shaman who made me the hat, honey, hers was a very old man. And when she started going into divination and doing her, her ceremony, her face turned into, I mean, this beautiful woman turned into looking like a really old man and her body motions and her hands and everything became like an old man. Zagda, in the scene that she's talking about, she has um, a young child spirit. And when the child spirit entered her, there was a confusion where she did not know where she was. And Zagda had to say, we're in the United States right now. We're not in Mongolia anymore. And this childlike spirit had this, this large Mongolian woman with all this amazing, you know, clothing and metal. And, you know, she's heavily weighted down. She was rolling around under our tree like a little kid. And her face became this like young, youthful child. And they all start speaking in the language of that person. So like her voice came out as a young child and she was like, ah, and she was doing these sort of different things. It's same like when we spoke about the woman who turned into a wolf when I was at the conference in Mongolia. You see this transformation. Now, some people think it's that um, uh, shape shifting. I don't nobody ever said anything to me about shape shifting. They just said they become they embody the spirit. That's the one. That's the one that they work with. And they all usually have one, a couple of them that they work with. And sometimes it just pops up out of nowhere while you're in the ceremony. And that's what she was speaking about. So you, I gather, haven't become possessed in that way yourself, have you? I have spoken in other languages. Uh, I don't identify with what that exactly is or if it's a specific person or anything, but I have had the experience of other things coming out of me verbally. And the idea of traveling into the different realms, the underworld or the heavenly realms, uh, you, you mentioned you were doing that already as a child. Yes, and I was, you know, and I just never had a class. <laughs> and actually my first Exposure to that would have been Michael Harner when I took a class with him on shamanic. Uh, we just wanted to try the experience of Michael Harner, but I didn't leave there thinking I was going to be a shaman or anything. But you meet your power animal, and I, the whole experience was very, very lovely. In any case, I guess it's fair to say that when the Mongolian shaman said to you, it's time for your initiation, and you'd already been twice to Mongolia, attending shamanistic conferences, you'd received all of these implements and clothing, and uh, along the way, it, it felt like the right natural thing for you to do. Yes. Yes. And I didn't even bring, well, I have objects from shamans from all different places, from Alaska, from actually those feathers are from the Alaskan shaman that were in my, my headdress uh, that was given to me by the president of the Haida Indians. I was presented three eagle feathers upon leaving as an honor for the work I did. I was assisting a dear friend of mine, Edna, who's a Haida Indian herself, and she was doing healing work. And I just came to assist and I was presented that at the end, which was a, a very big honor. Well, Gail, what a amazing experience you have had. What a life you have had. And how joyful it is for me to be with you and to share your wonderful experiences with our viewers. Well, I want to say it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience that I'm very grateful to have had this initiation and it has definitely affected my life and who I am. And I wanted to just sort of give a shout out. Thank you. I had to write down, but I wanted to give a shout out to a couple of Mongolian people just so that they know that we, that I spoke about them. And I also wanted to just mention one other thing that during the initiation, I was to recite over and over something which I have heard, I believe, I'm not sure if it was Tina Turner, that it saved her through her divorce and things, 
but it was the Buddhist prayer, or I don't know if it's a prayer, but it's Om Mani Padme Hum. And I had to repeat that over and over and over and over again. And I believe now that I understand it was part of a Buddhist combination, shamanic initiation, how that chant would work out perfectly in that time. So I just wanted to say thank you, because all these people are the people who've helped me to get to this place, being an, a, a, a translator, a person to receive my calls and speak to the other people, and they have all gone bend over backwards for me, and they also have supplied me with all these amazing things and tools and then the information. So I just wanted to thank Tugi, Bhatbayar, Zagda, Ayuna, Dr. Lagwa, Dr. Lagwa Ja, Khanda, Honey Shaman, and may he rest in peace, Zoritz Batar. So I just want to thank all those Mongolians because Ayuna and Bhat Bayar have opened their home, their hearts, and they've become our family. And uh, if I didn't have my Tugi and my Namuna as my translators, I wouldn't have been able to even share a lot of this information. And they get it all to me like an hour before our show. So they get it and it's done. So I just want to thank them all. I really feel blessed to know them and to be a part of their life and for them to be part of my family. Well, and I should let our viewers know that there's a big chapter in your life that we haven't even touched on yet that we plan to talk about, which is your experience with the shamans of the Huichol culture in Mexico. Yes, and I even have clothing to wear for that one also. <laughs> I look forward to that. It's um, uh, that it's a very interesting thing, and we also have a Weechol visitor right here now, so that whenever we do do that, if we have questions ahead or questions afterwards, we'll be able to ask in Spanish and get an actual answer from a Weechol if anyone has questions arise that I'm not able to answer. Well, Gail, once again, thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me, Jeffrey. You've just like my shamanic initiation, being on your show has changed my life. So I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.